I'm Charlie Bright with Gold Derby, and today I'm speaking with uh, Jeff Orlowski, the director of The Social Dilemma, as part of our Meet the Experts uh, panel regarding documentary and nonfiction. And uh, The Social Dilemma is currently available on Netflix, and it is also nominated for seven Emmys, I believe. Is that correct, Jeff? Uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah, yes. Thanks so, for the yeah, absolutely. So, uh, how did the uh, one of the interesting things about the film is the way that you know you have your standard sort of documentary presentation, but you also have this uh, narrative parallel of this family and how uh, and seeing this real life this example of how social media affects us in real life. Uh, how did the idea for the parallel family story come to be a part of the documentary? Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, it was probably a year into production where we had spent all of our time meeting all of these tech insiders, um, engineers, former executives, employees at different levels within the companies. And the whole time we were really trying to understand how this technology actually works. Like what is machine algorithms? What are they doing to society, to us as individuals? And, and um, honestly, it came from countless conversations from the engineers just trying to better understand. So wait, what is it doing? Like, how is the algorithm thinking? Like, what is it actually trying to accomplish? And the whole narrative concept that, that you're referencing came out of the idea to bring the algorithm to life. How can we show people what's actually happening on the other side of your phone? What is, you know, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google, all of these um, platforms uh, that we don't pay for in most cases that have like, we don't pay for them and yet they're worth hundreds of billions of dollars like where is that money coming from and what is this technology doing to us um it was that concept of anthropomorphizing if you will the algorithms and letting people feel that 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 kind of drove the whole backbone for that narrative portion the family story just then became the parallel to the algorithms when you could bring to life the algorithms you could see how that was being applied to a, a family and hopefully put audiences in that same perspective um, I think it, I think audiences really felt, um, as opposed to just hearing the tech insiders and the engineers explain what was going on, um, to hopefully have a visceral feeling in response to how the technology is working. So uh, in, in that parallel storyline, you had mostly un unknown actors in the dramatic roles, but you did, uh, there was one bit of a standout in that the AI was portrayed by Vincent Carthizer. Uh, who most people will probably remember as the smarmy Pete Campbell on Mad Men. He was great doing that, by the way. Um, uh, what made you want to go with a more recognizable face for that role? Um, yeah, when we first spoke with, um, uh, with, with him about the opportunity, it was just interesting because Vincent didn't really use social media at all. He was like very against social media. And so when we started aligning, um, he really spoke to the material just in terms of how it would be portrayed. We also had this desire to, we were bringing to life three different types of algorithms um, based on like the broad strokes of what the company's optimized for. So very often they optimize for engagement, they op optimize for growth, and they optimize for ad revenue. So we wanted one person who could pull off all three of those roles and kind of bring a different personality to it. So um, every time we, we spoke with Vinny about it, it just like really resonated and felt strong. Uh, about his role and his fit for the film. So you know, you, you have all of these uh, uh, tech insiders that you were talking about, these former executives at very big tech companies. Um, but there's also, you know, th there's also, you know, they're all sort of saying their own thing about it. But I, I have to wonder how much collaboration is actually going on with those subjects you interviewed to really try to tackle the way that we consume information and how these and how all of this is regulated yeah um some of them there, there's one organization that we work pretty closely with tristan harris and his organization the center for humane technology and many of the people that we met were advisors to that organization that was kind of an early entrance point so some of them had been spending time years in fact trying to think through how to how do they articulate this problem and how do they work on being activists within the space to try to elevate these issues so that was one of our early entrances and early partnerships to a handful of people that were working to some degree together. Um, and it was through that process of then constantly trying to meet more and more insiders who were willing to speak on the record. Um, that took a long time. Um, it was very hard to, to get people to speak. Um, in some cases, there were NDAs that they were risking breaking. Um, in some cases, there were people who spoke um, but never referenced the company that they worked for and were very careful about the language that they used. Um, in some cases, we spoke with people anonymously 
um, off the record uh, as background research to better understand the issue, to better understand the way the technology worked. Um, and uh, I think one of the big things is that we've been seeing now, just in the last year or two, um, just how many organizations are really starting to work on this and focus on this. Like this is, in my, I'm obviously biased, but in my mind, this is one of the biggest issues facing humanity, that we have technology that is completely unregulated, that is affecting the way billions of people think and act. We can talk about January 6th, we could talk about COVID misinformation and COVID vaccine rates. There are countless arenas which the information ecosystem in which we all inhabit is being broken down and the ability to get quality, meaningful information is deteriorating in our society. And how do we operate a functioning democracy? Like literally democracy is at risk and is at stake based on the technology and the way we've designed it. And so um, uh, it, it's just been really thrilling to see how many people are now really coming out and speaking out, out about the issue more and more. You know, you brought up exactly what I wanted to ask you about. Um, after, you know, you, this, this, you made this documentary, I'm guessing over a couple of years and then uh, premiered, I believe in September of last year. Um, so there, you know, quite a bit has happened since then. Uh, so after making a documentary like this, um, and of all the things that you mentioned, you know, I live right outside Washington, D.C., January 6th, me, uh, as a very, you know, it's a very uh, meaningful thing for, you know, me and many others. Did the events of January 6th surprise you at all? Or were you expecting something, or were you expecting something like that would eventually happen? Um, yeah, I think for many of our film subjects and kind of through proxy, kind of what has been embodied in me at the same time, um, I don't think January 6th was surprising, nor do I think that January 6th will be the be all and end all of stories like that. Um, first of all, issues uh, and, and political turmoil and upheaval around the world is continuing to happen in countless other countries. And while we don't have a president that's on Twitter on a daily basis right now in the way that we did in the past, the issue of political polarization in the country is still happening and is still diverging the way our country thinks and sees and understands itself. That is, I, I mean, there's one of our subjects who referenced, uh, we, we posed a question to him, what is the worst case scenario in his, in his mind? What is he most worried about? And his response in the interview was civil war. And he we, said it quickly too. That was the other thing. Yeah, it, it came right out and that we included that line in the film. And, and I think when we were first releasing the film, there were people, even partners of ours or people who were working peripherally on the film that felt like that was a bit too much of an exaggeration. They're like, oh, what, you can't possibly be serious. And then when January 6th happens, I think all of those people came back and were like, oh, I get it now. Like I didn't realize just how much social media could affect the real world. Um, and I think that's the reality that we're, we're now living in, um, especially during a time during COVID when each and every one of us is spending more and more and more time on our personalized feeds. Um, I, I look at these types of social media, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, they are giving each and every one of us our own personalized story that evolves uniquely to you, that creates this feedback cycle that's unique to you. It is an, it's actually a representation of divergent evolution. Like we are literally speciating ideas, speciating thought across society so that each and every one of us, if we all use Twitter or Facebook, each and every one of us has a different Twitter or a different Facebook that's being personalized and customized to my experience just to keep me on the platform. Um, I, I fundamentally, this might seem extreme to say, but I fundamentally do believe that this technology is incompatible with a healthy and functioning democracy. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not even gonna try to counter you on that because I think at your core, you're absolutely right. Um, the, uh, a bit more lighthearted, there, there, there is a great Please. joke a little at the end of the movie uh, that, you know, there, where you're like, hey, follow us on social media. Oh, wait, no, go to the website. Uh, um, and I was wondering, did it take a lot to think about how to get people uh, to act and, and become a part of the solution after seeing the movie yeah. without relying too much on social media? Right, exactly. Um, yeah, and my, first of all, I've stopped using all social media in the making of this film. And um, I actually feel a loss from the doc, doc film community, where I, that's a place where I used to engage with the doc film community, and I'm no longer participating on those platforms, um, just because I don't want to be engaged. I don't want to be a lemming in, in that system. Um, and also to clarify, as you were saying, like 
there is, in my mind, there is good technology and there is bad technology. Um, there's plenty of technology that we pay for, right? The ability for us to have this conversation remotely right now is being facilitated through great technology that allows for real-time, multi-person conversations. Um, and so our team, uh, we're really trying to focus on having direct engagement with our community, but not focusing that through social media. Um, and, and so that's one of the places where people have gone to the website, have engaged, have filled out, you know, engaged with our newsletters. Um, there are ways to get that information and to share the story and the issue with the public without going through, uh, you know, a platform that's mediated through a third party for their financial goals. Well, uh, Jeff, thank you so much for uh, talking with us uh, right now. We look forward to seeing you at our panel a little bit later. Yeah, thank you, Charlie.